opportunity to welcome those who are joining us by means of the internet, our friends and the family of Frank McClellan who are in Germany, our friends in Wyoming, and our friends in Columbia, South Carolina that we're aware of, and if others are joining us around the world, which we know you are, if you'll email us, please, we'd like to hear from you. Now for all of us, if you'll open your Bible to the book of Genesis, strange passage for an Easter service, but in the book of Genesis, chapter 4, we'll find our text for the service today. Beginning at verse 1, Genesis chapter 4, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? Why art thou angry? And why is thy thou countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shall not thou be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. A pastor and his visiting evangelist stood on the steps of the church that morning, greeting and observing the worshipers who came. As they stood together, a chauffeur-driven limousine pulled up at the curb and the chauffeur came around and opened the door and assisted an elderly woman from the car and into the church. As they walked past, the evangelist said, My, that must be a wealthy woman to arrive at church in such a manner. The pastor responded and said, Let me tell you the story of this woman. Years ago, when she was young, she and her husband had one child. He was just a young lad. When unexpectedly, the husband took sick and died. And at his death, the family was left destitute. She had no skills. She had no way to try and, and maintain a livelihood. And with all of the pressures of that upon her, she fell sick herself. And in desperation, one of the neighbors came and took the son and brought him into his house to raise him as his own. And he worked on the farm of that neighbor. She, in turn, was taken to what we call the poor house. She was put on public assistance, and because of her sickness and other needs, she resided there. As occasion would provide, that young boy would go visit his mother. And with every visit, he would leave saying, Mama, one of these days, I'm going to come and get you, and I'm going to move you out into your own house. Well, the boy grew. He worked hard on the farm. He was a good son to that neighbor who had brought him into his own house. He studied hard. And having finished high school, he went off to college. And having finished college, he went into the business world. Well, everything that he touched just seemed to turn to gold. And there came a day when he drove his vehicle up in front of that poor house. 
and said to his mother, pack up what few things you've got and say goodbye to these folks here for I'm taking you to your home. And he took her and drove her into town and outside up onto a hill that overlooked a vast valley that made up that region that they called their city. And there a brand new, just completed mansion. They pulled up into the yard and mama said, son, this is beautiful. Who lives here? He said, you do, mama. This is your house. I built this just for you. And I want you to enjoy the good things of life. And the pastor said, that woman and her son are two of the most outstanding people in this church. And every time the doors open, that limousine pulls up to our door. And she gets out and comes in and bows her head and says, Thank you, God, that you have seen me through my hard times and that you've been all that I need. And thank you for the blessings of this day. Jesus Christ came to a world that had been sold into the poor house of sin. But he said, I'm going to bring you out. And I'm going to give you life in abundance, both here and forever. And the only way that can be accomplished is that he became the worthy sacrifice that God demanded for our sins. Now it was into a perfect world where God had planted man in the Garden of Eden that the sickness of sin entered and brought death to Adam and Eve, robbing them of God's presence, robbing them of God's power. But God gave them this promise. He said, I will provide, I will provide a Messiah, a Savior, a Deliverer, who is going to crush the head of the serpent that hath beguiled you and taken away from you all that I have given. I'm going to provide a way that you can be restored. You and all your descendants in the history of the world by blood and by covering. And God slew a lamb and covered, made a covering for their sins and made covering for their naked bodies and promised their Messiah. And he said that one day my Messiah will be the destroyer of the one who has destroyed you. And so Adam and Eve began to look for a day when that promised son would come. And that brings us to our text now, she bore a son by the name of Cain. Now, you may not agree with me, but I believe that when Cain was born, Eve thought that the Messiah had been born. For she said at his birth, I have gotten a man from the Lord. They were looking for Messiah. They were looking for their Savior. God had promised a, a child would be born and that he would be the deliverer. And I believe that she thought she had born the Messiah. Oh, how vastly wrong we can be about things sometimes. But then, she bore another son. His name was Abel. Now Abel, the name, means emptiness, vanity. It means something transitory and unsatisfactory. In other words, 
she said when she named her boy, you are just unnecessary. I've already got a son. I don't need another one. Why, you're just a, a, a product of vanity. Now, that's a good way to name your child. That'll bless you, won't it? Every time your mama calls you, she's saying, I didn't want you. And uh, here is a boy whose name is Abel. And he is named that because I personally believe Eve thought she already had the Messiah that was sent from God. Now the boys have grown. I'm sure I could get an argument at this point, but I want you to know I believe that they're about 30 years of age because that's the time when a priest begins his ministry. And these boys have been with mama and daddy all of their lives. They have been with them to worship. Now I know as I read the scripture that Eve and Adam had taught their children about how to worship. Every time they came, they brought a lamb. God had given a lamb to provide for their sin. And God had taught Adam and Eve that this was to be repeated. And so they came and they offered a lamb. Now the boys come on their own to begin their work of making atonement for their sins. Now notice what happens. Cain, the Bible says, brought an offering of the fruits of the ground. Now may I say to you, I'm convinced that if you had been there, you would have seen that Cain brought the very best that he had. I don't believe he brought secondhand stuff, rotten stuff, wilted stuff, I believe he brought the best that he had. Because religion always brings its best. And man does his best in order to try and please God. But Abel, though he was considered a nothing and a nobody and unnecessary, he had learned the truth of the gospel. And that is that without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And so Abel brought what God had commanded, an offering of the firstlings of his flock. And as he makes his sacrifice, and by the way, the Bible says that God favored his sacrifice, but refused Cain's sacrifice. How did he know that? Now I think I can prove this if you're willing to look at the word of God seriously. I believe that God sent down fire from heaven and consumed the sacrifice of Abel. The sacrifice of blood. God sent down fire. If you look in other places, there are at least four, if not five, places in the Bible where God sends down fire upon the sacrifice. When Moses dedicates the tabernacle, God sends fire down upon the altar. When, when Solomon dedicates the temple, God sends fire down upon the altar. When, uh, he, when Elijah puts the offering on the altar and pours the water on it, he prays and God sends down fire on the altar to consume the sacrifice. And so here is Abel bowing before God, declaring God, I'm unworthy. I'm a nobody. I'm a nothing. I'm a wasted life. I have nothing to bring except that which you have commanded. But according to your command, I bring this offering and I'm giving it to you and I'm pleading be merciful unto me, O God. Have mercy on my soul. Forgive me of my sin. Restore me to a right place of blessing. May I live, O Lord, under your anointing for my life. And I'm putting words in his mouth, but that's the indication of Scripture. And then I believe fire came. And God had respect to his offering. But over here on Cain's, 
there is no respect and no fire and the works what Cain had said was I'm going to give you the best I've got I'm going to give you the best I can give I'm going to give you what I think you deserve and God did not accept his sacrifice Abel is a type of Christ Cain is a type of false worship Cain is a type of false religion which always says works are due Abel is a picture of true religion a religion of grace which says it's done and it's done by the blood Adam in his order became the head of a race bound for hell Jesus became the head of a race bound for heaven Adam became the head of a miserable race Jesus the head of mercy's race Adam was the head of a fallen race Jesus is the head of a free race Adam the head of a depraved race Jesus the head of a delivered race Adam founded a lost race Jesus founded a living race Adam was the head of a corrupted race Jesus the head of a cleansed race Adam was the head of a ruined race but Jesus the head of a redeemed race Adam is the head of a sinful race but Jesus the head of a saved race and Adam is the head of a guilty race but Jesus the head of grace race in Adam we're all polluted in Jesus hallelujah we're all pardoned in Adam we are all earthly but in Jesus bless his name we have eternal life he is the worthy sacrifice what as what we see in this Genesis passage is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ as he comes to die on the cross for you and me Jesus is the world is the worthy sacrifice because he prayed the price for the sin of the world his blood is precious blood his blood is accredited blood his blood is acceptable blood his blood is boundless blood, blessed blood, beautiful blood. His blood is covering blood, Calvary's blood, cleansing blood. His blood is defeating blood, dear blood, delivering blood. His blood is effective blood, enduring blood, excellent blood. His blood is faithful and faultless and forgiving blood. His blood is guiltless blood and it's God's blood and it's glorious blood. His blood is holy blood, hallowed and healing blood. His blood is infinite blood and it is impeccable blood and immaculate blood. His blood is joyful blood and justifying blood. It's Jesus' blood. His blood is keeping blood and bless God it's sin killing blood and his is love's blood and limitless blood and it uh, reaches to the farthest sources of mankind and his blood is merciful blood majestic blood miracle working blood marvelous blood his is necessary blood noble blood and nurturing blood his is omnipotent blood overcoming blood his is once for all blood his is permanent blood and pardoning blood and prevailing blood and purifying and precious and powerful blood his is quickening blood and it's quality blood there's none other like it in all of the universe his is redeeming blood resurrecting blood restoring blood it is tenacious blood timeless and tested blood it is tried and it is triumphant blood his is unchanging blood unfolding blood unequaled blood virtuous blood valuable blood and it's whosoever will blood and in many of our songbooks and in some of the Bibles of today it's X'd out blood but it is yearning blood it is the zeal of the Lord blood and one day this blood will zoom us all to glory hallelujah for the blood of the Lord it's the blood 
It's the blood that was on the altar of Cain. It's the blood, the blood of Jesus that was shed on Calvary. The blood that Jesus shed for me way back on dark Calvary, the blood that gives me strength from day to day will never lose its power. For it reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley. The blood that gives me strength from day to day will never lose its power. Aren't you thankful for the blood? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Nothing else I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. God said, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass. I will pass over you. Have you had the blood applied? Well, preacher, I'm religious. I didn't ask that. God's not asking that. Well, preacher, I joined the church. That's good. But I didn't ask that. Neither did God. By the way, if you're saved, you ought to join the church. Amen? Amen. I talked to some folks not long ago. Hand up before the Lord. They said, uh, we haven't found a church since we moved here. I said, how long have you been here? Four years. I said, four years and you can't find a church in Ori County? My soul, we have 130, I believe it is, of Baptist churches in Horry County. You'll stumble over one if you're not careful. If you're saved, you'll join the church. Amen. Be a part of the church. It's the body of Christ. It's the blood-washed body of Christ. It's the organism through which Jesus works to reach the world. And you ought to be a part, be a part of the church. Hallelujah. I'm about to have a spasm just thinking about it. Some of you that need to get in the church. It happened several years ago. Back in the late 1940s, as a matter of fact. In the city of Chicago, there's one of those large, tall buildings. And on the top of it is a giant cross. And everybody traveling through can see that cross. And like so many things that you see occasionally you just forget that it's there. Do you ever do that? Just ride past places and not see what you're passing? And people do that with the cross. So many times it just loses its appeal. It loses its drawing to them. And so that cross had been there for years, but people just really didn't pay attention to it. But something happened one day, and suddenly the whole city's attention was called to that cross. TV cameras gathered in the streets down below. Reporters were everywhere. Firemen came. Policemen came. Some of them had rushed to the top of the building. For they were going to paint the cross. And as they were painting the cross in the windy city, as the wind began to blow, it began to blow the platform on which this man was working about. And he became tangled in the ropes and he was actually pinned to the cross and those ropes twisting tighter and tighter against his body were going to choke the very life out of him and his whole future was hanging in the balance in just a moment of time he could either be choked to death or he could be released and fall to his death and suddenly a city that had no attention for the cross at all was riveted on the cross, not because of the cross, but because there was a man on the cross. And folks, I want you to know there were thousands of people who were put to death by crucifixion, but the one who on that day in the center cross as the Son of God, as the sacrifice of the Father, he hung there and the whole world, even to this day, our attention is riveted upon him who paid the price for your sins and for mine. He is the worthy sacrifice, for He is God's sacrifice. He is the worthy sacrifice, for He brings the blood of the Lamb, God's Lamb, to offer it. 
He is the worthy sacrifice, for it's His blood alone that can make an atonement for your sins and mine. He is the worthy sacrifice. Not only is He the worthy sacrifice because He died for us, but He is the worthy sacrifice because He arose from the dead. As the Lamb of God, He died for the sheep. But as the Lord of the sheep, He rose to lead them on to glory. You see, folks, the greatest evidence that Jesus is God is the empty tomb. No other religion can make that claim. Only Christ overcame the grave. Father Time met King Death. He was sitting by a tomb. Hello, good friend. I guess you're here to seal somebody's doom. You might say that. Shy death replied as a smile came across his face. For inside lies that Jesus man who said he'd save the race. And you time, why are you stopping here? Don't you have things to do? Oh, I just come each day to draw the veil and let the morning through. Say, death, why are you watching just one grave with all your vast domain? Looks like to me you'd be rambling round, smiting folks with pain. But this one's something special. For he challenged me, they say, said he'd lay here just three days, then he'd get up and walk away. Now, I am the conqueror, you know. They don't talk back to me when I step in and smite a man. It's for eternity. Well, I can testify to that, Father Time replied. I haven't seen one shake the dust since you were in your prime. But I've got things to do, so I must be on my way. I'll see you when I come back again to make another day. So Father Time passed up the hill to cause the sun to rise and left death standing by the tomb, so mighty and so wise. The next day, time passed by again and asked how things were, he inquired. Kind of quiet, old death replied. I'm starting to get a little weary, but I won't be here long when you come by about this time tomorrow, for I'm anxious to get on my way to spread more grief and sorrow. The next day, time passed again, and he was quite surprised to see old death quivering on the ground in frightful agony. His eyes were set, his cloak was marred, his clothes in disarray, and it wasn't hard for time to see old death had had his day. What happened, death? Asked Father Time. What makes you look so bad? Why, you've never looked this way, so weak and so sad. Death pulled himself up upon a rock. He was looking sick and humble. He hung his head and wrung his hands and time could hear him rumble. I was sitting here at the break of day, just about to take my stroll, when all at once the whole wide world seemed to rock and roll. The stone moved from the door and skipped on down the hill when all at once everything grew quiet and still. Then I saw him standing in the door. He did not move nor speak. And all at once I felt myself becoming tired and weak. Then he came out of the grave and got a hold of me. And he threw me on the ground and he placed his foot on my neck and then he took my crown. He took away my keys and placed them on his side. And now I must go and face old Satan and tell him that I lied. For I had made a vow to Satan. I promised to hold him down. But with power like I've never seen, Jesus came up out of the ground. He is alive. Up from the grave he arose, a mighty conqueror o'er his foes. He arose, O victory, 
with a proud domain where he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose. And because he arose, he still passes this way today. He's alive today. He left glory and came to earth, ascended back to the Father. But his spirit is still here with us today. And he moves up and down the aisles. He visits with the choir. He's there at your pew. And he's touching your heart. And you who are sorrowful. And you who are weak. And you who are captive to sin. And you who, with whom life seems so miserable and meaningless. And you who are looking for direction so that you'll know which way to go. And you whose heart yearns for a special touch from God a word from the Father. He's stopping today to say he's alive. He's alive. And he has in his hand the love of holy God that he will dispense to everyone who by faith call on his name. A while ago many of you lifted your hand to say in my life there is a special need, a real hunger. I need God to touch me. This one who died on Calvary, who came out of the tomb, is passing your way right now. Let him have his way. And in a moment when we give an invitation hymn, I'm going to ask you, who raised your hand to be among the first to make your way down to this altar, some of you saying, I want to trust Christ as my Savior. I want to know my sins are on the blood. I want to know my name is written down in the book of heaven. I want to be a part of God's family. I want to be what God would have me be. And I want to come. Sinner friend, come today trusting Christ. You whose life has been wasted, where Satan has had such a time in you and he has just taken you down roads that you never thought you'd travel and he's left you beaten and wrecked and bleeding and you don't know where to turn now and you can't find any direction, you can't find any hope. I'm going to ask you in just a moment to leave your place and come down here and at an altar of God just pour your heart out and the same God that loved the prodigal son, the same God that reached down and touched the wounded man by the side of the road, the same one that met Zacchaeus up a tree, the same one who touched the woman with the issue of blood will touch your life. And he'll make you new if you'll trust him and lean on those everlasting arms. And those of you today who want to be a part of this great fellowship of believers, where we are pooling our gifts, where we're pooling our talents, where we're giving ourselves and our energies and abilities so that God might take us together as one body and thrust us forth to touch a world for Christ. I'm going to ask you to leave your place and just come and say, I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. I want to join this church. I'm a member of another church, but I want to be a part of this church. I've been saved, but I've not been baptized. I want to join this church. And so God's speaking to your heart. I'm going to ask you when we say in just a moment that you'll leave your place and you'll come. God's speaking to your heart. Oh, He was early when He raised your hand and God's still touching you now. And I'm going to ask you that when we sing that you'll respond. Heavenly Father, I ask in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, my blessed Savior, the King of glory, the victor over death, hell, and the grave, I pray that you will draw now by your Spirit, Father, and may these many, hearing your voice, feeling that tug at your, their heart, that they will respond with a yes to God, and they'll make their way down these aisles. Oh, Lord God, be glorified in every decision registered here today. I pray for that young man there. I pray for that dear dad there. Lord, I've prayed for him so many times. I'm asking you to touch him afresh today. I pray for this couple here. I pray for that family there. I pray for that young lady there. I pray for this little girl. Lord, you've spoken to her heart. And now in this invitation, Lord, may every decision registered be for your glory, your honor, and your praise. And we'll lift our voice. We'll declare, you are worthy. You are worthy, O oh Lord. Jesus, our King. And it's in your name I pray. Amen.